Well, good morning, church. Isn't it great to see our youth serving um, on mission for him? So thankful for uh, that great mission trip and really living out our vision. There's a lot to celebrate this morning. And one other thing that I just wanted to make sure that we can mention and we can celebrate is the Supreme Court decision from this Friday. And so it's just a reminder to us, 50 years of prayer and protecting the least of these. And so what I want to challenge our church to do is first, persistence in prayer. You think about the 50 years for Roe v. Wade to be overturned, but also no church that now we need to continue to be pursuing uh, the well-being of all people womb to tomb. You know, one of the biggest things people say about the church is, oh, well, the church doesn't care about anyone once they come out of the womb, right? And so we need to make sure that we are continuing to care for others. But uh, one thing in particular that I wanted to mention is, you know, well, first, just so you know, if you are a Christian, you are um, basically two, uh, two and a half times more likely to adopt a child if you're a believer rather than, just, uh, rather than the average American. But still, only 2% of American families will adopt, 5% of Christian families. So you still see there's, while that is much larger, it's still a small percentage. So I want us to challenge one another to be supported of those families, and in particular in our church we have a couple, um, Jeff and Becky Halcom, who have adopted one child already, are in the journey, in the process of adopting a second. And so I just wanted you to know about them and to be praying about them, because really, um, I'm very thankful for this decision on Friday, but it's just one step of many, and what we need to do as the church is Yes, we are pro-life, but that means we are pro-life from womb to tomb, right? And so I want you to be praying for Jeff and for Becky and for the Halcoms. Be praying for whatever child it is that God already has for them. And we as a church want to be supportive of that. So while I'm very thankful for that, no, that does not mean that Work is done, right? We need to continue to be all about um, caring for everyone in our society. So with that, um, with that being said, and as you saw our um, students on mission, a lot to celebrate, and really them being on mission kind of ties in with, especially they were doing some homeless ministry as well, working in a church there. It really ties in with the passage we're going to be looking at this morning. So if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn to the book of Luke chapter 10. The book of Luke chapter 10. And we're going to be looking at a parable this morning that most of us, I would guess, are pretty familiar with. It's a parable most of us are familiar with. But uh, I hope we can have kind of new eyes to see how it might be really applicable to us. Luke 10, as you're turning, turning there to Luke 10, one other thing that I want to um, encourage all of you with this morning is as we worship God, one way we worship Him is through the giving of our tithes and our offerings. And you can see different boxes. So if you're here with us in person, you can drop your tithe or offering in those different boxes. You exit the sanctuary this morning. If you're joining us online, we're so glad that you are. And you can give through our app or our website, or you can mail in that tithe or offering. Another way that we worship God is through our giving. Now, Luke chapter 10, we're going to look at the parable of the Good Samaritan this morning. The parable of the Good Samaritan. And it's one that we've, most of us have heard, but let me just set the context a little bit for us this morning. See, Jesus is having a conversation. What he has is he has a lawyer that comes up to him and is trying to kind of catch him, so to speak. And really, this parable sums up in two different questions that this 
lawyer asks. If you know anything about the story, we have Jesus make a Samaritan the hero of the story. And that's really interesting. It would really grate against any good Jewish person. Because if you think, 750 years prior to this, what happened is we'd had, uh, there's this pagan group, the Assyrians. They had come in, they'd invaded Israel, and they'd wiped out Israel. Now, if you remember in Jonah, do you remember how Jonah didn't want to go preach in Nineveh, didn't want to go preach to the Assyrians, right? He talked about how terrible they were. He didn't want them to be forgiven by God. He was worried that they would come in and invade Israel. Well, sure enough, some of his worries came true. The Assyrians came and they wiped out most of Israel. And the Israelites that were left stayed there, settled with the Assyrians. They ended up intermarrying with one another. So these Assyrians marrying these Jewish people would end up, uh, they would create the Samaritans. Now, all the Pharisees thought these Samaritans were less than, how could you ever intermarry with these pagans? And in fact, when they went to go build a new temple, the Samaritans offered to help build the temple. And you know what the Jewish people said? No thanks. We don't want any part of that. Well, so then the Samaritans went and built their own temple, their own place of worship on Mount Gerizim. If you remember when Jesus is interacting with the woman at the well, she starts to try to ask him, well, why do you worship on this mountain and we worship over here on this mountain? So there's been this divide, this issue, and any good Jewish person didn't even travel through the area of Samaria. They'd walk all the way around just so they would not have to interact with Samaritans. Yet now we're going to step into this story. We're going to see that Jesus take someone they would consider less than, take someone who they would consider an enemy, an outcast, and Jesus being Jesus is able to put him at the paramount of the story. So with all that context being said, I'd invite you to stand in honor of the reading of God's word this morning. One of our students, Amanda Eberts, is reading for us from Luke chapter 10. Luke 10 verse 25 to 37 Then an expert in the law stood up to test him, saying, Teacher, what must I do to inherit life? What is written in the law? He asked him, How do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, he told him. Do this and you will live. But just wanting to justify him, he asked Jesus, Who is my neighbor? Jesus took up the question and said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him, beat him up, and fled, leaving him half dead. A priestess happened to be going down that road. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. In the same way, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, saw him pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan on his journey came up to him, and when he saw the man, he had compassion. He went over to the man and bandaged his wounds, pouring olive oil and wine, and then put him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him. When I come back, I'll reimburse you for whatever extra you spend. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The one who showed mercy to him, he said. Then Jesus told him, go and do the same. Let's go to Lord in prayer this morning. God, we love you. We are thankful for your word. God, though I know we've heard this story before. I pray, God, that you would just let us examine it in a new way. Lord, let us examine our hearts this morning. Lord, I pray that you'd give us your eyes to see the needs that are around us. Lord, that we could be your hands and your feet. God, I pray you'd soften our hearts. 
Lord, that we could truly pursue the good of our community. God, we pray for the next few moments, Lord, that you would remove distractions from this place. You'd bind the enemy from this room. God, you'd turn our mind's attention and our heart's affection to you and to your word. Pray that you'd speak to us now and your spirit would move. It's in your son's name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Do you ever get that feeling sometimes you just need to stop while you're ahead, right? Here we have this lawyer that shows up, this expert of the law, comes up to Jesus and asks the most important question that we can ask in this life, right? Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He's thinking about eternity, He's wondering about eternity, an incredibly important question for him to ask. Let me just ask you this. Have you asked that question yourself ever? Now, we're, we're going to understand as we get into it, he phrases it wrong because he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? We know the gospel tells us it's not anything that we can do, right? It's what Christ has already done for us on the cross. But he's thinking about eternity. And that's incredibly important. So this, is a, this seems like it's a good thing. It seems like maybe he has the right motives and he wants to think about all of this. You know, I was just... Last night, I was tucking Avi into bed. She wanted me to tell her a story. She had two of her baby dolls. One was significantly larger than the other one, and she said, Daddy, I want you to be this one. And I said, okay, thank you. And, and she said, I'm going to be this one. And I was like, okay. I was like, oh, you want me to be the bigger one because I'm Daddy and I'm bigger, right? And she goes, no, Daddy, that one doesn't have hair just like you. <laughs> She's like, look, this one has curly hairs like me. <laughs> if you just give me the bigger one, I could have thought it's because I'm big, strong, mighty dad, right? Could have just stopped right there. I may be follically challenged, but I don't want to appreciate my three-year-old pointing it out, right? What we're going to see with this guy, look at this. Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus, being a good teacher, answers the question with a question, right? <laughs> what is written in the law? He asked him, how do you read it? And he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly. He told him, do this and you will live. But look at verse 29. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Wanting to justify himself. So let me just ask you this question this morning. Do you want to be justified or do you want to try to justify yourself? Do you want to be justified or do you want to try to justify yourself? You notice what this lawyer is doing. We understand now his motives for asking these questions, right? He's not asking these questions because he really wants to understand the answer. He's asking these questions in a way where he can pat himself on the back and say, I've done a good job. This is every other religion except for Christianity, right? What must I do to be saved? Let me find the checklist and let me go ahead and knock those checklist boxes off, right? Let me see what I can do to take care of myself. So initially, while a great question is asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Let me just say it again clearly. If you're sitting out there and you're wondering, you're thinking, I've got to do something to be saved. Know that Jesus went to the cross to pay the penalty for your sins and for mine. You don't have to do anything. It's already been done. What we, have, what we then, in response to what Christ has done, is we repent and we turn to him, we trust in Christ's finished work on the cross. That's how we get eternal life. 
not based on anything that we can do, but what Christ has already been done. So initially, a great question is asked. But then Jesus says, yeah. What, what do you say? And the guy quotes yeah, the greatest commandment, right? Love God and love your neighbor. Now Jesus says this, do this and you will live. Well, here's the key, right? Have any of us ever loved God perfectly and loved our neighbor perfectly? Of course not, right? Of course not. We see this great command and we realize we can't ever measure up to these perfect commands of God. And that's why we need to repent and trust in Jesus. But this lawyer is looking for a loophole because he's a lawyer, right? He says, trying to justify himself, who is my neighbor? And if you think about this, there's nothing new under the sun, This idea of trying to justify yourself is something we see happening all around the world today, right? This new morality movement in our nation is people just trying to justify themselves. You can go all the way back to Adam in the garden, right? Adam and Eve are told, hey, you've got this whole garden. Don't eat of this one tree. What do they do? They eat the fruit, right? God shows up, says, Adam, what were you doing? And you know what he does? Big, old, strong, brave Adam, right? He points right to Eve and says, she made me do it, right? Trying to justify himself. It was her fault. And then what does she do? She goes right to Satan. It was his fault. He made me do it. Justifying ourselves. Going all the way back to Adam, humans have looked for ways to justify themselves. And so, look what Jesus does. This lawyer wants to engage him in a debate. But Jesus, instead of engaging this debate, and obviously Jesus could have very easily won this debate, but he doesn't engage him in a debate. Instead, he tells a story. He tells a story. He talks about this man who's going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell into the hands of robbers. You see, this man is asking, who is my neighbor? But at the end of this story, what we see is Jesus completely flips this question around. What Warren Warren Worsby says, I love it. He says, Jesus changes this question from who is my neighbor He changes the question to, to whom can I be a neighbor? It goes from, who is my neighbor? Let me exclude as many people as possible. Let me just zero in. Because if I've just got one or two neighbors, maybe I can take care of them, right? And what Worsby says is Jesus flips this question on his head. He says, to whom can I be a neighbor? See, neighbor, this idea doesn't have anything to do with geography, with citizenship, with race, with class. God's plan is inclusive to all people, regardless of age, race, gender, socioeconomic status. God's plan is inclusive. And see, what this lawyer wanted to do is he wanted to take this general idea of a neighbor And he takes this general idea and what Jesus does, instead of just talking in generalities and saying, oh, maybe about this, Jesus applies it to a specific situation. To a specific situation. So instead of talking about generalities, instead of having a debate, Jesus challenges the expert of the law with a specific situation. You know, one thing that drove me crazy, so I went to... um, I took kind of a long winding road with seminary because I was working full time and I actually went to a, an extension campus at seminary for my first couple of years. And it was with all these pastors who were, who were uh, you know, in full time ministry. So we went, to, we went to class on Mondays all day. 
And I really enjoyed the, that first probably two-thirds of my seminary experience. It was really, uh, really practical. The people that were coming and were teachers who were working with, man, I, I'm learning with other pastors who are in the trenches. And then, um, in fact, that's why I'm so excited. In this fall, I'm going to be teaching a class at the Midwestern Extension um, at, at First Baptist of Allen. Same thing for, for guys uh, who are already in the trenches doing ministry. I love that. Well, then after, after about two-thirds of my seminary degree was done, I moved up to the Fort Worth area. I was pastoring a church, and then I went to classes on campus. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting in these classes with these, um, with these kids who weren't like actually serving in the church, but they wanted to have all these hypothetical theological debates. And they wanted to kind of get on to me and say, like, the way that I was doing things wasn't necessarily right. I'm like, just go out there and actually do something, right? Actually apply the knowledge that you're learning and actually go and do something. Sometimes it's really easy to debate in a classroom. Or just to talk in generalities when there are specific situations all around us of people who need a touch. I think we're about to celebrate the founding of our nation next week, right? Fourth of July. And I love the freedom that we have here. I love specifically the fact that we have the freedom to assemble here. We have the freedom to worship. We also have the freedom to witness. We can go out and share our faith. We have to worry about being in prison for that, Right? The freedoms that we have, we should be very thankful for. But I just want you to just imagine if some of our founding fathers, you know, as, as man, the British Empire is just relentlessly taxing us. If they said, you know, let's just, let's talk a little bit more about what we want to do about these taxes. And then in 1773, when they came in with just yet another tax, a tax on tea, right? What if they just said, let's just debate and let's just talk and man, maybe we can come to a resolution. No, what did they do? They went out there, they grabbed the tea, and they chunked it in the ocean, right? They, 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 were, they took some actionable steps. And then we know there's the Declaration of Independence in 1776. But I think what we need to think about as a church is there are times when we need to move from debating about issues to actually doing something about it. We need to do something about it. Sometimes we can be Christian rubberneckers. What does a rubbernecker do? They see an accident, they slow down, They stare at it and they just keep on driving, right? What did the priest and the Levite do in this story? They see a man who's beat up on the side of the road. And what do they do? They look, they saw him. They cross over the other side of the road. They don't want to become ceremonially unclean. So they say, I'm not going to go and I'm not going to help out this person. And sometimes that can happen with us if we're not careful as we just rubberneck and we say, wow, look, the world's burning all around us. Thank you, Jesus. I'm saved, right? Let's go hide. Let's go hunker in the bunker and let's wait for Jesus to come back, right? The world is evil. Let's hang out here. We've got the truth. It can just burn. And Jesus actually tells us that we are to be his ambassadors, his witnesses, that we are to step out into the world and we are to be light. We are to be salt. We're supposed to help push back the darkness. You know, it was was very interesting as I was talking with um, a a few of our deacons, and we were we were talking and we were sharing. We were were very openly, honestly, we were sharing about how man, there's just there's just different needs in our church that need to be filled. We have some empty holes. We need some volunteers. We're we're doing things. We're getting things going. Man, it would sure be nice to have a few more volunteers. And, and one, of our, one of our deacons, um, Bob Foster, is in his 90s, and he said, you know, he goes, 
the way I see it, a need constitutes a call. A need constitutes a call. And I think about that as this Samaritan was going by the side of the road. He saw someone who was hurting. And what did he do? He stopped. And he tended to this man. And he took care of him. And he bandaged his wounds. He put him on his own animal. He took him to an inn. He took two denarii. Two days wages. Gave it to the innkeeper. Said, please take care of this guy. Nurse him back to help. Back to health, excuse me. And if any costs go above and beyond what I've already paid you, you let me know, and I'm good for it. I will pay the rest. I don't think when he got up that morning, he thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to go down these different roadways. I'm going to wait till I find someone who's been jumped by robbers. Then I'm going to care for him. I don't think that was necessarily on the Samaritan's agenda, was it? But he saw a need, and so he stepped in. And sometimes, look, he said, he had compassion on him. He had compassion. Then Jesus turns, after he tells the story, he asks this lawyer, which of these three do you think proved to be the neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The one who showed mercy to him, he said. Then Jesus told him, Go and do the same. Now, sometimes we think about the cost of what it takes to care for someone. But I'd argue what this story shows us is that it's too costly not to care. It's too costly not to care. Yeah, it cost the Samaritan time, money, two of the most valuable resources that we have. But that Samaritan's one good deed in this fictional story has inspired sacrificial ministry all over the world. Have you ever heard of a little organization called Samaritan's Purse? (laughs) Where do you think they got that name? If you have ever filled up, uh, you know, an Operation Christmas Child box, all right, that, that goes to provide gifts and the the gospel to children all over the world. You can trace back the name of that organization, right, to this particular story. It's all about perspective, isn't it? It's all about perspective. And what Jesus wants us to do is Jesus wants us to focus on the individual, not the cost. Jesus wants us to focus on the individual, not the cost. You know, when I think about this, this is why I love uh, taking people on on mission trips. I love seeing our youth serving in D.C. I love the fact that here in just two weeks, um, I'll be getting to go with the team to the Dominican Republic. And I I love doing missions. First, we know that we're called by God to go into all the world, right? We're, we're actually fulfilling a mandate that, that God has given to all of us when we do missions. And the other thing that I saw, when, especially when I was a student pastor, there was no greater accelerant of spiritual maturity than people who went on missions. Because when you go somewhere and you say, I'm going specifically to go to serve someone else, I'm going to step outside of my normal routine, and I'm going to go to a specific place To be Jesus' hands and feet. That is my only agenda. It's amazing what happens. And then what I love seeing is that people can capture the vision of, oh, what I'm doing there, I could do right back here. You know, I was talking with uh, another one of the deacons in our church, Chris Fisbeck, and he went on this mission trip with some of the students, and they were doing prayer walking. And they were so encouraged by the response they got as they were prayer walking some of these different neighborhoods. Chris came to me and said, man, Zach, these, these youth are excited and we want to do prayer walking here in Bridgeton. It's like, that's awesome. Take those things that you learned there and let's apply them to where we are here and now. It's all about perspective. Jesus is challenging this lawyer. Instead of trying to justify yourself, 
I want you to look at people the way that I see them. Look at people the way that I see them. Think about this traveler. Think about the perspective. This traveler. To the robbers, he was a victim to be exploited, wasn't he? Let's take advantage of him. Let's jump him. Let's take everything that he has. He was a victim to be exploited. To the priest and the Levite, he was a nuisance to be avoided. I've got too much other stuff going on. I don't have time to deal with that. Not, not going to touch. To the Samaritan, he was a neighbor who needed help. So as we think about needs that are all around us, how do we view these needs? You know, Jesus puts it this way. When he came to earth, he says, the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the king of kings, the creator of the universe, the ruler of the world who humbled himself and came here to earth. Why? To serve us. Now, I think there's one thing really important for me to mention here. When we read this story, yes, I completely believe that God is compelling us to be his hands and feet in the world around us. The other thing that we have to understand as we read this story is we think, well, I, man, I can never be that perfect neighbor that God is calling us to be. And you know what? You're right. None of us can be. So as you read this story, we understand that this good Samaritan really is just a picture of Jesus who came to us when we were beaten on the side of the road, when we've fallen into sin, and he's the one who nurses us back to health. So ultimately, what we have to understand is this isn't a go work harder and be a better neighbor so you can be saved. That is not the point of this story. I believe Jesus is teaching this lawyer, you cannot save yourself. You have to trust in Christ's finished work on the cross. So don't miss that mega point of all of this. We can't save ourselves. We can't ever do enough. We don't serve to earn salvation. We serve because Jesus has saved us. We don't serve to earn salvation. We serve because Jesus has saved us. So this, this parable shows us ultimately we can't justify ourselves. We need to be justified we need a savior. So I think there's two, two categories of people here with us, in person, online, those of us that realize I've been trying to save myself. Now I need to turn back to him. I need to turn to Jesus and let him save me. So if that's the case, I'd love to talk with you at the conclusion of our service about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. But for many of us in this room, we've already made that decision to trust in Christ. We've already said, okay, I've, I've submitted my, my heart to him. I want to follow after him. I want to serve him. And if that is the case, what I, what I want to challenge you to do is I want to challenge you to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And, and I want you to be praying even right now. What is it that I can do to love my neighbor, to serve King Jesus? What is it that I can do? Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. God, we love you. God, we're thankful for your word. And God, as we think about what it means to Love our neighbor as ourselves. God, I pray that you would give us tangible ways 
to serve others in the days ahead. God, I pray there's anyone in this room that hasn't yet made that decision to trust you, that they've been trying to work hard to save themselves, to justify themselves. God, I pray that you'd show them that your son, Jesus, has already done it. He lived that perfect life. He died on the cross for our sins. God, we need to repent and trust in him. God, I just pray right now, Lord, that you would challenge us, Lord, to be your hands and your feet in the days ahead. We love you, Lord. In your son's name we pray. Amen.